privilege to welcome you all here today for a talk by Joanna Millen, a Holocaust survivor who's here representing the Holocaust Educational Trust. And you know who I am, most of you, I'm Louise Wilmot. This talk has been organised not by me or by the department itself, but by the students in MMU's History Society. And we're grateful to them today. There'll be an opportunity after the talk to um, ask some questions of Joanna. She's agreed to do that. But for now, I'll just thank you for a wonderful response to this talk. All the proceeds from it will go to the Holocaust Educational Trust so that it can continue its wonderful work. And before Joanna speaks, I'd just like you to introduce you to Hannah Hardman who is representing the Holocaust Educational Trust, and she's just going to say a few words about it. So here's Hannah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah Harbin, and I'm a Holocaust Trust, Educational Trust Regional Ambassador. In 2012, I took part in the Holocaust Educational Trust Lessons from Auschwitz project. As part of this project, I had the opportunity to hear first-hand testimony of a Holocaust survivor, Siggy Schiffer and visited the Nazi concentration and death camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. This afternoon, I am delighted to welcome Holocaust survivor Joanna Millen, who has travelled here to share her testimony with you all. I know you're here to listen to Joanna, so I don't want to speak too long, um, but I would like to, uh, to take a moment to outline why I, it is I, um, I've arranged um, for a Holocaust survivor to join today. It is easy to forget that um, each victim had an individual story, Every single person who was affected by the Holocaust had a family. They had friends and they had aspirations for their future, like you and I. When you read textbooks and are presented with facts like 1.1 million people died at Auschwitz, it's hard to relate to the fact that each of the indiv individual victims were ordin ordinary people, just like everyone here today. I want to thank you all for attending. To prevent a repetition of the past, it is vital that we continue to remember and learn about the Holocaust. It is hard to comprehend the statistics we um, usually face when we learn about the Holocaust. Whilst we should remember them, I hope you'll all agree that it's important to remember the personal stories. I am so thankful to the survivors, such as Joanna, who give us the opportunity to hear their t um, experiences firsthand. I hope you will all join me in ensuring that the stories such as Joanna's are shared with future generations. As history moves further into history, the importance of remembering it does not lessen. As George Santayana once wrote, those who forget history are destined to repeat it. I hope hearing Joanna speak in a moment will remind you all of the importance of learning about the Holocaust, but also encourage you to tell others and future generations um, who may not have the opportunity to hear directly from a survivor. But before I pass over to Joanna, please check that your mobile phones are switched off. And remember, at the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So please have a think about what you may want to ask. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Joanna. Uh, well, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I hope you can hear me at the back all right. Excellent. Everyone can see the pictures as well? As they go along? Excellent. Right. Um, well, every year uh, we have a Holocaust Memorial Day. I'm sure you all know. Do you know what date that is? Does anyone know when that takes place? 27th of January. 27th of January. Fantastic. And that day is the day that Auschwitz was liberated. Of course, there's lots of discussions about why we should choose that date. After all, there are many significant dates, uh, but the government decided that you know that was the most convenient time during the uh, the academic year, when it's probably the coldest and the snowiest, and the most difficult to get around. But nevertheless, that was the date that was chosen. There was a lot of um, issues around what it was called because um, it it embraces other genocides that we should remember. And they were, amongst them was myself, but said it should be called genocide, um, you know, a date to remember genocide. Uh, however, you know, as we all know, the majority seems to get, uh, you know, the, the result. And so it became Holocaust Memorial Day. And it's celebrated or commemorated 
throughout Europe and in many other countries. There was a, a, a conference in, in Stockholm uh, many years ago that instituted this day of commemoration. Now, what is the purpose of this day? Why do we still remember the Holocaust? What do we hope to learn from it or to gain from it, if you like? I know it's just after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't allow alcohol in if it did lunch time. <laughs> <laughs> just so it doesn't happen again. Right. Well, we had this quote about learning from history. Um, because this didn't happen out of the blue. It happened over, of course, centuries of discrimination, but it speeded up during the, uh, the Nazi period. People elected the Nazis because they promised jobs, they promised that the inflation would, would go down, everything would be great, Germany would be a great nation again. And you know what happens when politicians um, you know, uh, write out their um, manifestos you know, in big writing, you know, all the good things. They don't, in the little writing underneath, it's all the things that you don't want to hear about. And so we have to be very careful. Um, uh, what's happening in Hungary today, you know, very right-wing governments are, are being elected in Europe, and especially in Hungary, where really, you know, lists of Jews and Roma are being made, and uh, we're talking about expelling them again. You know, these echoes are very, very worrying. So by learning about history, it wakens us to dangers. Maybe some, we can intervene before these awful things could happen. And so, when after the Nazis were elected, of course, then things got worse and worse for Jews because, and, and other minorities. I mean, everyone knew they were racists, but they didn't care because it didn't affect them. So, learning from history is really important. Uh, maybe we can stop, but of course, there have been genocides since the Holocaust. We haven't learned these lessons. Over 100 million people have been killed just in the 20th century alone in genocides. People were killed because they were different. I'm not talking about soldiers in wartime. I'm talking about innocent people, unarmed, somehow became the other. We haven't learned these lessons. We know about many of these genocides. I mean, we can think about Rwanda and Darfur and Kosovo and Bosnia. And uh, what about Albania? And what about um, in, in China? and uh, many, many other countries as well. Over 100 million people. Everybody knew what was going on. These were not secrets. <coughs> and people said, oh, it's not our business, it's not, in our, it's not in our continent, it's not in our community, it's nothing to do with us. So it's really, really important. We hope that this next generation will, will say, hey, you know, it's not going to be in our lifetime. So, but there are other reasons as well why we still think about the Holocaust and remember it. Because millions of people were killed. I mean, we're talking about 12 million people killed. Six million of them were Jews. One and a half million of them were Jewish children. 90% of all Jewish children in Europe were killed. These are figures. And if you think about somebody being killed one per second every day, day and night, non-stop, it would take three months to kill six million people. Each is an individual member of a family. Now, many of them have no graves, no memorial. And so by talking about them, it's a way, it's a memorial, isn't it? It's so much more personal than having a memorial, a stone memorial in the middle of a city. I go to so many places when I talk, and I ask them, who's, who's that man in the middle of your town? You know, that memorial, that man on the pillar. Who is it? And you know, virtually nobody knows anymore who that person is or what they did or why. So this is a living memorial, so much more powerful in a way. And by talking about them myself, I talk about my parents, my grandmother who had no grave, no one to remember them at all. And many, many millions of other people in the same position. But also I'm very concerned that history is being rewritten. People write books about the Holocaust, make films about the Holocaust. How many of you have read books like The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas or seen the film? 
Many of you, yeah? Nobody's, nobody's admitting it, huh? <laughs> okay. Do you learn history? No, you don't. It's a historical fiction. It is not a true story. In fact, virtually nothing in that film or book is true. It is a book that raises issues and discussion. And why I have a quarrel with the author is that nowhere does it say that it's a fiction. You know, the book is, is fine if you just use it to, to discuss issues. And you see films. I mean, I went to see the film um, um, about Abraham Lincoln. How much of that is true? I don't know. I mean, I know a little bit about slavery, but probably no more than the average person. How much of that film is true? It's a lovely film. I mean, it doesn't detract from the interest of the film and how, you know, it's a good film. But you don't learn history this way. And so by learning from first hand, from a survivor, reading books like this book, we remember every chapter is, is written by a survivor, a child survivor, their personal history about how they survived. These are primary sources. It's really important to get your information. And so that's why I feel very compelled, in a way, to share the history of my family, because this, you know, is primary information. It's really important. And also, the Holocaust Explained website that I was working on uh, through the London Jewish Cultural Centre, top acad academics have, have had input in it. There's some survivor testimony as well. Brilliant first-hand information. So, right. So this is why I, I go and talk. People often ask me, so uh, I've answered that question. That mythical question. Somebody was bound to ask me. Now, this picture that I've got out there, who do you think that is? You think so? You think I'd change very much? <laughs> no. no. Yeah? No? I was three years old in that photograph. And that's the age I was when I arrived in England on August the 15th, 1945. And I want you to imagine what it would be like as a three-year-old arriving in a strange country with absolutely nothing. We take so much for granted. Think about having absolutely nothing. Think about having no parents or family. No photographs, no memories. That dress was given to me by the Red Cross. I had no clothes of my own, no toys or possessions. Think about all the things that you have at home that you take for granted. I arrived in this strange country. Everyone around me was talking this very odd language, which I later discovered was English. And I didn't know whether I was going to get another meal, what was going to happen to me. I was really terrified because Leaving the camp was always bad news because no one ever came back. And so being taken from the camp on a plane to a strange country, can you think how frightening that would be? Now, it's taken me quite a long time to piece together what happened to my family. I eventually got access to the Nazi archives, to the Red Cross archives, and found photographs and information and documents which I will share with you. And of course, a lot of this I found out relatively recently because with the coming of the internet and the web, more archives going online, I was able to find out more and more about my family. And, um, and some of it, I mean, only just a few months ago. Now, my family lived in Berlin and um, not long after the Nazis were elected, the Nuremberg Laws were passed. Now, these only affected Jewish people. My family lived in Berlin, was subjected to these laws. Nobody cared about them or protested because it only affected Jews. It certainly affected my family. They said, no, it's, it's not a problem. It doesn't affect us. Why should we bother to protest? And the purpose of these laws was to persuade Jews to leave. Very few were able to go. You had to have uh, lots of money or contacts abroad. Most Jews were trapped in Europe, like my family. Now, I'm only going to go through a few of the clauses, but how they affected my family, and particularly children, uh, to give you a flavour of how this worked, because the Nazis wanted people to leave. 
but they made it almost impossible to do so. Headlines appeared in the newspapers. We don't want Jews, we don't want, uh, they're going to take our jobs, our hospital beds, our school places. These were headlines in the papers in the 1930s. Now, does that sound familiar? I showed some headlines uh, to a group of journalists from Eastern Europe. And I showed some from the 30s and some from last month or so. You couldn't tell which were the modern ones and which were the ones that were then. Nobody wanted to take in Jews. And when borders were relatively open, and now borders were closed, one country even went so far as to say that one Jew allowed in was one too many. So Jews were trapped. They had nowhere to go. Now, first of all, German citizenship was removed from all Jews, including my family. Now, of course, citizenship is such a vague notion. But what do we mean by citizenship? I mean, the obvious one about not being able to vote to take part in political activities, but there are many other things that, as a non-citizen, you can't do. For instance, what other things can't you do? You, yeah, apart from not fear not voting. You can't work, you can't uh, get a job, your signature doesn't count. You can't own your own home anymore. People threw you out and moved in and you couldn't go to the courts to complain. You were a non-person. And you could be attacked in the street or your friend killed and you couldn't go to the police for protection. You couldn't access your money in the bank. Your signature didn't count. Your money was frozen. So you became a non-person. You became totally separated from the rest of society. And in fact, without a passport, you couldn't travel without express permission by the Nazis. So life was very, very difficult, even with that one bit of the law. And then Jews were forced to wear a yellow star and all their outside <coughs> clothing. I'm sure you've seen pictures of this. Now, the Nazis didn't invent this idea of badges. For centuries, in many different countries, Jews were forced to wear different badges, different types of clothing to other people. But, you know, people think, well, it's a badge of identification, isn't it? Because the Jew looks like... What does the Jew look like? Yeah. Like anybody else, exactly. But so it was a badge of identification. But think about badges. There's another side to badges, because if you wear a club tie or a school blazer... The badges then become a label that you're an insider, you belong. So the badges not only were identification, but it was also a badge of shame and humiliation. You became an outsider. Everyone said, oh, that's a Jew, don't have anything to do with them, they're nasty. And then Jews were not allowed to work. They had to uh, go to a, a Nazi-run employment office, like my parents both had to do. And, and even if you owned your own business, you had to give it away to a non-Jew. So Jews were taken out of most businesses. Now, a few Jewish shops were allowed to stay open, but basic commodities like soap and milk and newspapers, Jews were not allowed to buy. Don't look for logic to these laws. It was just to make life so unpleasant and horrible that Jews would be forced to leave. But where? <coughs> Jews had no access to any form of transport. They had to walk everywhere. But again, it wasn't sufficient to walk. You had to walk in the gutter. You were not good enough to walk on the pavement with other people. Again, humiliation. And then you were not allowed to have any fun at all. You couldn't go to the swimming pool, the, the park, the sports facilities. You couldn't go and eat out or go to the cinema. Uh, even the library was forbidden. Park benches had painted on them forbidden to Jews and big signs appeared outside towns and villages. Jews not welcome. We don't want Jews. Now, the radios were taken away from Jewish families as well. And there was a curfew, but not a nighttime curfew like you're, you might know about. Um, you were only allowed out for about three hours every day just to do some basic shopping. Jewish children were taken out of school. Now, this was am amazing because an, a Jewish child might be at a school with non-Jewish children. One day, they were going to school, going to their friends' houses, mixing with their parents, you know, having a total interaction. And then the very next day, they turned their back on you. They wouldn't have anything to do with you, wouldn't speak to you. 
and he then became totally without non-Jewish friends. There was a total separation between Jews and non-Jews. <coughs> now, Jewish children were sent to Jewish schools and they were not allowed any secondary or tertiary education. And the pets were taken away from Jewish families, not just dogs and cats. Any pet that the Jewish family might have were taken by the Nazis. <coughs> Anything on wheels also was taken, even little scooters and things like that. And then in 1939, they, uh, the Nazis insisted on people filling out a census form. Now this was quite significant because on it you had to put whether your parents were Jewish or whether your grandparents were Jewish. And so before that time, people uh, had the impression that this was uh, a campaign against Jews because of their religion. Now it became a racist policy because even if you were converted or you were not religious at all, you couldn't avoid being Jewish. You were Jewish by blood. My, my mother had to fill one of these out, and I'll show you a copy of it in a moment. If you had only one Jewish grandparent, you were counted as being Jewish. Now, even today, I don't like to put my religion on official forms because I remember how the Nazis misuse this information. And maybe one day we'll have a government that might not like Jews again. So this was quite significant. So this sort of sets the scene to how my parents were living in Berlin. Now, I visited Berlin the first time in 1989. And isn't that a significant year? What, can anyone remember what happened? Germany got reunited. Germany got reunited. Germany got reunited. But how, how did they become reunited? The Berlin, Berlin Wall was taken down, yeah? And that was significant because <coughs> where my parents lived and where the Jewish cemetery, the Jewish hospital were being born, the Nazi archives, everywhere I wanted to visit uh, was in, once, in what was once East Berlin. And of course at that time Russians didn't like visitors very much. And so as soon as the war came down I thought this was the opportunity to go and start and go and see where my parents lived and so on. So the first call of, port of call was the Jewish cemetery, and of course a lot of people think that's a funny place to start research, but cemeteries are very useful, they keep a lot of archive material. And I found my grandfather's grave, Benjamin Schalmach. Um, he had a business in Berlin, it was quite a successful business, hiring out carriages for weddings. Remember in the early 1900s not many people had cars, so carriages were hired on special occasions. And he died of natural causes in 1935. And then I found a picture of my grandmother, his wife, Augusta. That's the photo <coughs> on the right. Now, the photo on the left is very interesting because only four years ago, after having posted the search notice many years ago uh, on the internet, sort of wondering whether anybody knew about my family, not getting any replies, you know, when you, when you send something out on the internet, you never know whether anyone's listening on the other end, do you? And where they might be. I got an email only four years ago from a lady called Esther living in Phoenix, Arizona. And she said that she was the granddaughter of my mother's sister and that she had photographs and information. And uh, wow, she was so excited. She didn't know that I'd survived. <coughs> And she gave me the picture of my grandmother, that's the one on the left. It was so nice, I couldn't resist putting it up there. Now, um, and we exchanged lots of information on the email, and then she said, you know, wouldn't it be great to meet? I thought, yeah, yeah, it would. So I got a ticket and flew down to Arizona, and she sent me a picture of herself so that I would recognize her at the airport. And I was a bit worried, I thought, how am I going to find this lady at the airport? And because you know what happens when people send photographs? Isn't it always when you're in your best outfit, you just had your hair done? <laughs> <laughs> or if you're older, maybe you send one a few years younger. <laughs> oh, no. So I was really worried and I had a band around my suitcase with my name, you know, woven on it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe she'll find me. But when I got to the airport, this lady came rushing up to me and gave me a huge hug. And she, she told me that I was the image of her grandmother. And we both had red hair. And the more I talked about her grandmother, 
I realised how much I had in common with her, not just the red hair. Uh, the love of cooking, the love of entertaining, and all, all the things that I love to do. So it was really, really great. So now my grandmother was the first person in my family to be deported uh, to a camp. Now, why do you think the Nazis particularly didn't want her? What is it about her? She's the elders of the community. She was old? So she had respect. Right, okay. Are there, are there ideas? She couldn't work. She couldn't work. She was too old to work. And the Nazis only valued people if they could be productive, could earn money for them. It usually happens to me. <laughs> um, she was too old to work. They only wanted people that could be productive to earn money. So they rounded up many, many elderly Jews and put them on what they called old age transport. Now every train was numbered. Everybody on each train was listed. They even listed those people that died on the train. My grandmother was deported in September of 1942, uh, first of all to Theresienstadt, and after a few months she was further deported to Auschwitz. Now, I sh I'm sure you've seen pictures of the trains with sliding doors, Jews were locked in. They were crammed in so tight they couldn't even sit on the floor. They weren't given any food, very little water, it took more than a day for trains to arrive. Some people died on the trains. My grandmother <coughs> arrived alive, on the platform, Nazi doctors made a selection process. A few put to work, the majority were selected for death, and they were taken to the showers. And outside the showers were pegs, rows of pegs with numbers on. And you sort of wonder, why on earth did they bother to number the pegs? What was in their mind? Everyone was going to die anyway. Why did they bother to number the pegs? To make them think they weren't going to die to make them think that they were going to come back out of the showers, pick up their clothes and be put to work. But by then, most people actually knew what was going to happen to them. But in the Nazis' mind, they wanted people to go in an orderly way, quiet, without resisting, would just go. This was important to them. My grandmother was taken into the showers. It took more than 20 minutes for Jews to be killed in the gas chambers there. All during the war, the Nazi scientists were trying to invent a gas that would kill people more quickly. And that wasn't to save the suffering of Jews, but to make it cheaper, to be quicker, so they could, uh, the throughput would be increased. And of course, when people died, they took the hair, and they used the hair to stuff mattresses and pillows, cushions, and also as hair triggers on guns. They took the gold out of the cheek because that was valuable. They piled up the clothes, they piled up the shoes, even the children's shoes, the glasses and every, all the possessions were in, in piles, and these were all resold to German people. Now, this uh, document was translated from the German and produced at the Nuremberg Trials. The top half, it shows uh, how much it cost to keep a Jew alive, and the bottom half shows how much income they would get from killing the Jew, from using their bodies and their possessions. So this was a factory with a board of directors and accountants. They were making money. This was a factory. These raw materials were human bodies. They they'd said that they financed the war for some considerable time through the income from this factory. And this is where my grandmother was killed in 1943. Now, Esther gave me this photograph also, and here are my grandparents on the right. Now, Esther's grandmother is the sister in the middle, the oldest one. My mother is the baby, the baby sister, uh, a lot younger, with a big bow. And this is only the second <coughs> picture I have of my mother. And my mother's middle sister is in the front. So that was great, the first time all my mother's family together. Now, 10 years ago, I had a very similar breakthrough with my father's family. The son of the little girl right in the front, his name was Isaac, he was living in Israel at the time, and again, I saw my search notice on the internet, and just by chance, his grandson went on the internet and found the search notice that I put out for my father. And Isaac phoned me, and he said he didn't know that I'd survive, and he, he told me that he was the son of my mother's sister, 
he had photographs and information and even knew my father. So not only could he give me photographs, but a bit about what he was like, what he was good at, what he enjoyed doing, so much more than a photograph. So this was really exciting. This was my first big breakthrough, only 10 years ago. And so we, we got talking on the internet, and then he said, you know, it'd be great to meet. I thought, yeah, it would. And so he said, look, I'm, I'm going to on holiday to Munich in southern Germany. Why don't you meet me in a restaurant for lunch? Yeah, why not? Doesn't one, doesn't everybody do that sort of thing? <laughs> so I arrive at this restaurant and, and I meet him there. And uh, funnily enough, we picked the same things on the menu, uh, for a huge menu, and we both, we, anyway. So we sat there having lunch, and he gave me this photograph amongst a few others. Um, <coughs> so for the first time, a picture of my father. He's the boy on the left, the one with the big ears. <laughs> His name was Siegfried Rosenthal. Now, um, Siegfried is a very German name, which shows that the family were not very religious, because if you were, they would have had biblical names, whereas Siegfried is a very German name. They felt, they felt German. Now, uh, the sister with the black sash, her name was Johanna, and she was married to a non-Jew in Berlin. And when the Nazis <coughs> came to them, they tried to persuade her husband to divorce her to save himself from being deported. Now, unusually, he said no, and they were both deported to Sachsenhausen, which is a camp just, where's? It's what? outside Berlin. Yeah, it's just outside Berlin. And um, remember, not all the camps were in Poland or Germany, okay? Um, they both survived the camp, unusually. Now, um, many non-Jewish partners did agree to divorce to save themselves. However, there was a group of, of non-Jewish wives who marched through Berlin protesting. And the Nazis listened to them, and none of their Jewish husbands were deported. And it just shows you that it was possible to protest, but most people chose not to. Now, the sister with the necklace, her name was Silla, she died shortly after this photo was taken, and his little brother, Kurt. Now, he became an engineer and in the 1920s, when work was so hard to get in Europe, um, he decided to immigrate to Australia. And of course, being an engineer, <clears throat> they were very happy to have him. And he took his family and settled in Melbourne. And there he opened up a factory making aircraft parts. Now, he had a son and a daughter as well. And she, they went as a family. Of course, as soon as Isaac told me about the family in Melbourne, I thought, hmm, let's see if I can find her. Wouldn't it be great? So I went online to the Melbourne phone book, looking for Rosenthal. So if I tell you that we're looking for a family called Rosenthal is like looking for a Jones in England, or a Smith or a Brown, you get some idea of the task I had in front of me. There were so many of them, and none of them related to each other. And so, yeah, I was very sad and reluctantly had to give up uh, the idea of finding them. But you know, chance is a funny thing. Two years later, after I'm, I, I got this photo, uh, I happened to cross an obituary in the Melbourne newspaper, which was the obituary of Kurt's daughter. And there it said that the family had changed their name from Rosenthal to Ross. So, ah, another clue. Perhaps I can find them this time. So back I went on the internet, and I did <coughs> find them. And um, so I contacted them on the, uh, by email, and they said, wow, they hadn't known that I'd survive. The usual story. And, and we, we exchanged emails, and they said, you know, why don't you come and meet us? <laughs> so this is a bit of a geography lesson here. And so, of course, how could I resist? And so I, I went down to Melbourne to meet them, and they all came to meet me at the airport, um, Kurt's three grandchildren. And um, they took me back home and had a lovely few days getting to know each other. They gave me photos and more information about Kurt and his family. Um, Kurt's son was a famous mathematician, uh, world famous. And one time he was actually lecturing at Manchester University at the same time that my husband and I were living in Bradford in the early 1960s. We both had sons within a month of each other but we didn't know of each other's existence. We never got a chance to meet. It was so, 
so close and yet so far. And unfortunately, he died as a relatively young man of a heart attack on a plane going to an international maths conference. I never got a chance to meet him, but his children uh, were the ones that met me at the airport. So this was very exciting, and they took me back to their home. They say they gave me lots of information. And uh, his youngest granddaughter was expecting a little baby, knew it was going to be a little girl, and he said, would, they mind, would I mind if they named the baby after me? So that was great. I was, I was obviously very flattered. The little baby arrived. And so we have a now a special relationship. We send birthday cards and Christmas cards. And um, they're coming to London in the summer, which will be great for the first time. Introduce them to my family. So now Isaac's mother is the sister right in the front. Her name was Paula. Now, I don't know if any of you believe in miracles, but this is probably as near to one as I could possibly think about. I mean, it was amazing what happened to them. They were also in Berlin, and she was married to a Polish Jew. And he was walking through the streets of Berlin in 1939, was attacked by some Nazi youth, injured, came home. Paula was very upset. He said, look, we've been trying and trying and trying to get visas to leave. Maybe we make one last effort. You know how it is? You, you try, you do, and you do, and you do, and nothing happens. And then you sort of give up. And then you think, give it one more shot. Yeah? I'm sure we've all been there. One more shot. And so the next day, he went round everywhere he could think of to get visas for the family to leave. And at the end of a very long day, he came back with one visa. This is a family of four. They're the parents, there's a son and a daughter. How do you decide who's going to use this visa? Only one of them can get out. Three of them are going to have to stay in Berlin. They knew what was going to happen to them. How do you decide? Are you going to give it to one of the parents or are you going to give it to one of the children? Isn't that a horrible decision to make? Just think of it. Well, somehow Paolo persuaded him that he should be the one to leave. And reluctantly he agreed. Now this visa was to go to Buenos Aires. And... I mean, halfway around the world. In, and he lived there until 1941. So that's for two years. He was living in, in Buenos Aires, and the family were living in Berlin. He earned a living making fur coats. Now, they were corresponding, but it's not like today, where letters arrive well, every three or four days. It was several weeks between letters, but they were in touch. Now, in the beginning of 1941, he happens to have a very influential, rich lady client, clearly got to know him and liked her fur coat, and she got talking to him. And she asked him what had happened to his family. And when she found out, she was shocked. She said, look, you know, I know people in government, maybe I can help you. And she got him to write down the names of the family on a piece of paper, and she went to the government offices, found the man who was issuing visas, and on his desk was a huge pile of papers. Now, as, as is often the case with civil servants and with uh, people uh, not terribly interested in their job, uh, that's a sweeping statement, isn't it? Sorry. I mean, anyway, he had a huge pile of papers on his desk. And he wasn't reading them very carefully. He was stamping them with the official seal, you know, one thing after another. And when he wasn't looking, she put this piece of paper amongst all the others with, with the names, and he stamped it without even knowing what he'd done. And that's how Paola and the rest of the family were able to join her husband, as late as 1941. Now, that was so late during the war. Virtually nobody escaped at that time. I mean, it was an absolute miracle. Now, Isaac gave me this photograph also, and for the first time, a picture of my grandparents. This is the other set of grandparents, my father's parents. This photograph was taken in 1915, just after the beginning of the First World War. On the left is Johanna, Kurt in the middle, Paula on the right. And shortly after this photo was taken, Kurt enlisted in the German army and fought on behalf of Germany. Remember, this is before the Nazi period. This very brave won the Iron Cross. Now, thousands of Jewish young men enlisted in the German army. Many of them were decorated with medals and, and other awards, but that did not save them from the gas chambers in the Second World War. The government at that time 
commissioned a survey. They wanted to prove that Jews were not enlisting in sufficient numbers, were not uh, supporting the government, were not being patriotic. Remember, this is before the Nazi period. When this survey came back, they found that proportionately more Jews had enlisted than non-Jews. And so they never published this survey because it didn't prove what they wanted to show. So both Kurt enlisted, and he came back from France uh, to his family. But my father had also enlisted, like so many other young men, and he was sent to fight in Russia. Now, you know Russia, this huge, huge country. Terribly cold winters, very difficult to get food supplies and ammunition to the German troops. And in 1915, he was injured and captured by the Russians and imprisoned until 1918, three years in a Russian prison. In 1918, when prisoners were exchanged, he missed out, he was ill in hospital, wasn't returned to Germany. Now, nobody could leave Russia at that time, and they sent him hundreds of miles away to a Jewish area called the Pale of Settlement and he became the accountant on the communal farm. In due course, he married a Russian woman there, and when she became pregnant, the time came for the delivery of the baby, both she and the baby died. Now, there was no correspondence with the family in, in Germany. The German authorities told the family that he was missing in action and presumed dead. So after 1915, the family believing him dead, there was no correspondence, no communication at all. And he had to remain on this farm until 1939, the beginning of the Second World War. He was sent back to Berlin with just the clothes he stood up in and a travel pass. And he arrived at his sister Paola's door. So you can imagine her face opening the door to her brother she hadn't seen for over 20 years. There he is standing there. Of course, she was delighted and he went to live with them for two years until they went to join her husband in Buenos Aires. While my father was living there, he gave my cousin Isaac maths lessons, because remember, under the Nuremberg laws, he wasn't allowed to go to school anymore, so he was very pleased to get some extra tuition. But he also had to report to the government office for work, he couldn't carry on being an accountant, and he was made to sweep the streets and clear rubbish from Berlin. Long hours, hard physical labour, hardly got paid, he had absolutely no choice at all. And after the two years, 1941, when Paolo and the family left for Buenos Aires, my father accompanied her to the railway station, and on the platform he gave her a Spanish-German dictionary. And inside was this little note my father wrote, it's in his own handwriting, wishing his sister well, hoping perhaps they'd see each other again, and it's signed by her brother Siegfried, dated Berlin, 1st of April, 1941. And that was the last time they saw each other. Now, until that picture I got from Arizona, this was the only picture I had of my mother. She was 16 in this photograph. Now, she'd also been married before, and at the time of the census, my mother filled the format, which was very unusual. Women had no legal status in Germany at that time. Uh, her first husband was too ill to fill it out, and I found his grave in the Jewish cemetery. <coughs> but he chose that both sets of parents were fully Jewish. Now, my mother was widowed. She was 40 years old by now. My father was 47, living on his own. His sister and family had left. They knew they were going to be deported very soon, and they were scared. And they met and they decided to get married so that they, at least they could be deported together. And much to their surprise, nine months later, I was born. And this is my birth certificate <laughs> <laughs> with my birth name on it, Bella Rosenthal. It does say on their wedding, it's not, I wasn't a child bride, that's just an area of Berlin that's called wedding. <laughs> <laughs> My mother also had to report for work, women had to as well, and she was told she had to go and work for Siemens. I'm sure you've all heard of Siemens, yeah? They've got a big presence here. Um, it's the same company that at that time were building the concentration camps. And I applied to Siemens in, in Berlin to see whether they would open up their wartime archives. I wanted to see what my mother had been doing and so on. Uh, but they will not open up their archives to anybody, even researchers. So they were employing Jews to build concentration camps that were killing Jews. And they built a wall right across the factory floor, one side of the Jewish workers, 
had to work long hours, had the horrible jobs in the factory, hardly got paid, and the other side were German workers. My mother had no choice, and while she was working there, she put me in the kindergarten, not far from where we were living. Now, remember, my grandmother was deported in September of 1942. By the end of February of 1943, the Nazis decided they were going to clear Berlin of all Jews. Jews were not working as hard as they might, and they were attempts at sabotage. And so they rounded up all the Jews they could find. Now, my father, working in the street, had nowhere to hide. And he was rounded up with all those other Jews. Thousands and thousands of Jews were, were deported. All the trains went to Auschwitz. Virtually nobody survived. Now, there's a picture in the archives showing Jews lined up along the pavement with guards every few metres. And they show Germans walking past. Now, what was interesting is they weren't staring like they were thinking, well, this is all. And they weren't deliberately looking away like they're pretending they weren't seeing anything. They're walking along like this was just normal. No issues. And yet Jews were being lined up to the trains to their deaths. And then there's another picture in the Nazi archive showing Jews being marched through the high street of a different town. All the townspeople crowded on the pavements and fathers had little children perched up on their shoulders just so they could see better. Little boys are climbed up into trees. Jews were being marched through the high street to the trains to their deaths. This was out in the open for everybody to see. One day, my father just didn't come home. My parents wished to be deported together. It didn't happen. My father was killed in exactly the same way as my grandmother in the end of February of 1943. Now, my mother wasn't rounded up at that time because the work at Siemens was considered too important. And the workers there were allowed to stay on till June of 1943, and then it was our turn. The Nazis came for us. They broke the lock of our apartment, took us away to a holding camp to be processed. The first thing my mother had to do was to sign away all our possessions. Everything was on the wrong list. Gate each item was a low value. These goods were put up for sale to ordinary Germans. The Nazis helped themselves to all the nice things. Everyday things were sold off. Tables and chairs, knives and forks, cups and saucers, beds, pillows, you know, everything you use every day. Now, there's another picture in the archives, in the Nazi archives, showing people falling over themselves with the first in the queue to get to all these good, cheap goods. There was an elderly German lady at the end of one of my talks came up to me, and she was pretty indignant and cross with me. And I thought, hmm, what I said, you know, the sort of checking all the things that I'd said. And she said, she said that she'd been to these sales and she'd bought all these nice cheap goods. What's the problem? So I looked at her. And so I asked her, I said, did, did, did you realise that these goods belong to Jewish people? And she said, oh, yes. What's, why, why should that be a problem? And then she could see I wasn't very happy with the answer. And then she said, well, I thought Jews were coming back. Is she crazy? I mean, do you really sell your bed if it comes back? And of course, she, she couldn't answer me. So once all these possessions were taken, my mother had to sign them all away. She had no choice. Um, she had to pay for the repair of the lock that the Nazis themselves had broken. She had to pay for the flat to be cleaned so that the Nazi sympathising family could move in. Um, she had to pay the lawyers that were drawing up all these documents and she had to pay all the outstanding bills. And finally, she had to pay for both our train fares, was going to take us to the camp. When all this was done, we were taken down to the railway station. Now, this is part of the deportation file. This is a Nazi document. You see the Nazi stamp at the bottom, the Nazi commander's signature to the right, the date, 11th of June, 1943. Now, you see, they've got my name, Bella, but now I have a middle name of Sarah. Now, the Nazis gave all Jewish girls and women the middle name of Sarah, all Jewish boys and men the middle name of Israel. That's just another label. And so, now the Nazis made lists of everybody on each train. This is page number nine of people on my train. Can you see I'm six from the bottom? I now have a number, TH145. But also, there are a lot of young children on this train because they raided the kindergarten where I was and they took the children and their parents as well on this train. 
And I, three years ago, I went back to Berlin and to the railway station from where we left and insert into the rails and into the platform of these plants. Each one commemorates a train. So there are 428 Jews on my train, all going to Theresienstadt, which is where? Czech Republic. Right, about 50 miles outside of Prague, more or less. Excellent. And this is an aerial view. Now, you see, this is not an ordinary town. This is a bank town. Czech soldiers have been living there. It used to be called Terezin. <coughs> and when the Nazis took it over, they changed the name from Terezin to Theresienstadt. And it became a camp unusually just for Jewish people. Of course, other minorities were sent to different camps. I'm sure you know what other minorities were imported as well. Roma, gypsies. Disabled, both physically and mentally disabled. Homosexuals. Homosexuals. Jehovah's Witnesses, excellent. Communists. Communists. Black people. Slavic <coughs> people. People from Eastern Europe. When we talk about disabled people, do you think young people wearing glasses are disabled? I would do, but they probably did. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody is prepared to stick their neck out, huh? Well, the Nazis did. They Remember, they were looking for this master race, had to be perfect in every single way. They were going to rule the world, this master race. But Theresienstadt was just for Jewish people. And this is roughly where Theresienstadt is. It's not to scale. And I haven't put all the camps on, because if I had, you wouldn't be able to read the map. There were so many camps. Now, if you visit Theresienstadt today, uh, it's a museum town. In the middle is a building that houses the Nazi archive. Now, this is huge and complete. And so I'm not going to spend all day going through the archive with you. <coughs> Don't worry. But I've taken out just a few figures to give you a flavour, an idea of what was going on in the camp while I was there. I was there from June of 1943 until I was able to leave in June of 1945. So I was there for two years. So these are Nazi figures. Exact figures. Everybody was counted in and everybody was counted out. Nazi doctors listed everybody that died of which disease or for which reason. Every single person. It's complete, methodical. And remember, there was no way out of Theresienstadt except in death. Now, people falsely label camps as death camps, work camps, ghettos, concentration camps. These are fictitious labels because everybody died. There was no way out except in death. So 140,936 Jews were deported just to Theresienstadt. And at times, there were seven times the number of people living there than it was designed for. So think about seven other families living in your home, and seven number of students uh, in your you know, in your lecture theatre. Think about it. And think about hardly being able to wash. You know, we're talking about a day or two. We're talking about weeks and sometimes months. <coughs> it was smelly and horrible. Dirty. Very, very crowded. People slept on bunk beds. They're not the sort of bunk beds that people sleep on today, one up and one down, sleeping along. These are about a metre and a half deep, so people were sleeping across the banks, touching end to end all around the banks. That's how they managed to house that number of people. Uh, the men and women were housed separately. The children were separated according to age, boys separated from the girls. And this was the average food ration, which is about 300 calories a day, which, having visited McDonald's recently, you know, they have the calorie values against each item there. 300 calories is equivalent to a small cheeseburger. And that's all you'd have to eat each day. And people had to work very long hours. Think about an average school day, if you can remember that far back. Um, if you double the number of hours. And this isn't sitting at a desk. This is hard physical labor. So it won't surprise you to know that one in four people actually died in the camp itself. Um, <clears throat> 
Children over the age of 10 was treated as if they were an adult. And these were the main causes of death in the camp, gastroenteritis, typhus and typhoid, stomach diseases, pneumonia and tuberculosis, lung diseases. Now remember, people wouldn't have contracted these diseases normally in their... It was only because of the horrible conditions. Of course, there were no medicines, no... You either died or you got better. I thought relatively few suicides, only 259 were recorded. Again, exact figures. I mean, considering the hopelessness people must have felt, I didn't think that was that many. People died of starvation and executions and polio. Now, I myself had hepatitis and scarlet fever. Um, most people died of those sort of diseases, but obviously I've inherited a good immune system from my family, and I, I got better, survived. I was very ill a lot of the time I was there, but I hung on in there. Now, as people died, uh, you, when you went to work, you, you walked over dead bodies. You know, they were sort of scattered in the, in the streets. But there was a van that went round picking up the bodies from time to time, and they were piled outside the crematorium, waiting for the ovens to be free. 190 <coughs> bodies were cremated each day in the crematorium there. There were four ovens, each one designed to cremate one body at a time, but the bodies were so thin, they actually cremated four bodies at a time in each of the ovens. And then they picked up the ashes and put them in little paper boxes. They put the name, the number, and the date, and they were arranged in neat little piles on shelves all around the crematorium. And when my mother died of tuberculosis, she was <coughs> cremated there. Only 33 people successfully escaped. Now, I'm surprised there were even that many, because remember, you had no arm, you had no weapons. The guard dogs were very vicious, trained to kill. Uh, you were starving, you had little clothing, you had no money, no means of transport, nobody outside that would help you. And of course, people like us living in Berlin, it was a long way. How would you get back, even if there was any point to it? Because you'd only be killed anyway. And there was always this human spirit of feeling that maybe tomorrow would be different. Maybe tomorrow you'd be free. As long as you kept your life, one day it'll happen. Now this is my mother's cremation record, and you can see that this is written in Czech. <coughs> Czech people were doing all the administration in the camp. Now, when I went to uh, Prague, uh, a lot of Czech people were trying to tell me that they didn't know what was happening there. But local people were, were doing all the administration. They were, it was all reported in the newspapers. The Nazis were building a Jewish <coughs> museum in Prague. And they were collecting Jewish artifacts and they had lists and photographs and film footage. And they were building this museum in Prague because they wanted to boast to the world how efficient they'd been in destroying all the Jews of Europe. So people must have known. And that's my mother's name, Elsa Rosenthal. Now, 15,000 Jewish children were deported. That's just to Theresienstadt. And I'm one of less than 100 children that survived the camp. Very few girls survived. Because if you think about it, a boy of eight or nine, could, they could pretend they were ten, so that they could at least be useful and be put to work. And many of the jobs were more suited to boys than to girls involving heavy work. For girls, it was much more difficult. I was with five other orphans. We were three boys and three girls. We had absolutely no toys to play with. <coughs> Nobody looking after us on a regular basis. We supported each other. We became a family unit ourselves, even though we were all of a similar <coughs> age. We all took on different roles. And women from the kitchens took it in turns to bring us whatever food they could, just enough to keep us alive. Now, through the internet, Lifsa's son, George, contacted me a while ago and told me that his mother, Lifsa, was a Czech Jew deported to Theresienstadt and her job in the camp <coughs> was growing vegetables for the Nazis. And the Nazis never realised that when she went into the vegetable garden, she was thin. When she came out, she was fat. She was hiding vegetables in her clothes to supplement her own diet, but she'd taken a fancy to me and brought me some fresh vegetables as well. I'm sure that helped to save my life. And I was fortunate enough to meet Litzka before she died. She was living in Cardiff at that time. And uh, we had a great reunion. 
Now, Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud, was so intrigued how the six of us managed to survive. She wrote a very important study, um, an experimental group upbringing. And this is very uh, famous, and anyone doing psychology or anyone working with children will read this study, so we've become a famous group. And these are some of the jobs that Jews were forced to do in Theresienstadt. Remember, this was all for the benefits of the Nazis. And while this was going on, the officers were living in comparative luxury. Uh, they had their wives, their children with them, their children were going to school, they were entertaining, having parties. Uh, swimming pools and so on. Now in June of 1944, the Red Cross heard about conditions in the camp and they decided to come and inspect. Well, of course, our commander had Carl Rung had plenty of chance to clean, the, clean it up, to hide all the evidence. He got everyone to clean the camp up, to paint the barracks, planted trees, flower beds. They even built a playground. We never got to play on it. And if you visit Theresienstadt today, the shower block they built at that time, still brand new, has never ever been used. And they built a pretend shop with goods in the window, there's no shop behind it, and a pretend coffee bar providing a pretend coffee. And they even went so far as to print some pretend money. They couldn't buy anything with it. And they built a pretend cemetery with pretend graves. No bones in them. The names on the stones were not related to anybody who lived there and died there. It was all pretend, and only a few graves. But of course, they couldn't account for all the ashes in the crematorium. Remember, 190 bodies each day were cremated there. So they just threw those into the river. And that's where my mother's ashes were thrown just before the Red Cross visit. And of course, they deported all the old sick Jews uh, to their deaths, and they brought in new Jews who were fit and healthy and couldn't tell tales. And they forced Jews to put on an entertainment a concert and a football match, and they forced one of the Jews to make a film about it. And this film was shown all around Europe. The Nazis were saying, look, what a wonderful town we've made for Jews, this far town. Look what they're actually enjoying themselves. And some people believe this film is used as a propaganda tool. If you visit Theresienstadt today, they show this film on one wall. On the other wall, they show what a film the Russians took when they liberated the camp. So you see the reality is against what the Nazis were pretending were going on. Now, the Red Cross visited. Uh, some of the Nazi officers came as well. And everyone was satisfied and they went away again. Shortly afterwards, all the Jews that had taken part in the football match, the concert, the entertainment, and the man that filmed all this were all deported to their deaths to Auschwitz. Now, conditions got worse again as soon as the Red Cross left. And, of course, the war was b b drawing to a close. Prisoners were brought on long death marches across Europe. With them came guards. More diseases, more overcrowding. Many people died just before the liberation. Now, the guards that came with these prisoners told our commander, Karl Rahm, what had happened to other commanders, and he got into a panic. He wanted to save his own skin decided to destroy the camp. And he got everyone to dig a very large tunnel. Day and night Jews were digging. Even children as young as six were helping to take the earth away. And the idea was when it was completed, he'd put all the Jews in, he'd put the gas in, seal it up, and we'd all be killed. And this happened for some time. And then he realized that this uh, tunnel wasn't going to be completed in time. The Russians were, were coming much faster than, than he thought and work was halted on this tunnel. Some recent archive material has come to light, which shows that if the Russians had arrived only one week later, this plan would have succeeded. So it sounds very dramatic, but it happens to be true. So then they thought of other ways of destroying the camp, but eventually the Red Cross heard about uh, what was going on, and they made a surprise visit. And they did a deal with Karl Rahm that he and his family would be allowed to run away if he didn't destroy the camp. And so he jumped at the chance and he ran away with his family. On the 3rd of May, the Red Cross took over control of the camp. We were one of the last camps to be liberated. But it wasn't until the 5th of May that the last of the Nazis left. And as they did so, they threw in hand grenades into the camp as a last act of defiance. And on the 8th of May, the Russians arrived, bringing with them doctors and nurses, because having liberated other camps, 
they knew what they were likely to find and they threw a quarantine around the camp. I was too sick to be able to leave and join the other children until the middle of June. Of course, everyone wants to know what happened to Carl Rahn in the end. He was arrested and tried and sentenced to death in 1947. Three houses were put aside for the children. I was in the house with the youngest of the children. And you can see it's not just from Germany and Berlin, but from other towns and new places. While we were there, everyone was looking for relatives, anyone left alive, of course there wasn't anybody. And then the international community were appealed to. And this time, we had a response from the British government. They said they would take up to 1,000 children into the UK, but only till we finished school. We weren't allowed to take British citizenship. And <coughs> children under the age of 16. Now, uh, of course, there weren't 1,000 children. In the end, just over 700 were found. It's about 750 were found. Some Stirling bombers were arriving in Prague. They were bringing back the Czech Air Force that were flying with the RAF during the war. These planes were going back empty. And there was a reporter waiting for a VIP who was late. And he was so intrigued by all these children and officials and planes, he started filming. And I found this two-minute film clip in the Imperial War Museum archive which gives you a flavour of what was going on. I'm not actually on this because I was on the very last plane that left. The Stirlings are short-range bombers. We came down in Holland to refuel, and we arrived at an airfield at Crosby on Eden near Carlisle in the middle of the night. Um, we were sitting on wooden crates because these are bombers. They didn't have seats. It was dark. It was very noisy. Um, and you can see in a minute that some of the boys look older than 16, which was the cut-off age, because whereas in the camp it was good to pretend to be older, now it was good to pretend to be younger, so that you would be entitled to go on the flights. Now, uh, this is when I arrived. The woman holding me had also been in Theresienstadt. And here are the six of us in the reception centre. The seventh child is the child of the carer. And from there we were taken to the shores of Lake Windermere. There was a hostel that was housing the workers from Holland and Wolf. They were building the Sunderland flying boats there. And of course, they'd gone back to Ireland, and this hostel was empty, made ready for us. And we stayed there for a couple of months until the Jewish community found a more uh, better accommodation. And the wife of an MP, Lady Clark, offered this house called Bulldog's Bank just to the six of us. A couple of German nurses who'd come over before the war uh, came to look after us. And there was a big change in our life. We were forbidden to speak any German, only English was allowed. And of course, we were introduced to toys, to proper food. Um, we were still terrified of dogs, and next door they had a little Jack Russell. You know the ones, little ones that bark a lot? <laughs> I'm sure it probably only wanted to play, but we were terrified of it. And of course, we had lots of nightmares. But we never turned to the adults, we always turned to each other like we had in the camp. And at nights we used to touch each other to make sure we were just asleep, that we hadn't died in the night. And, you know, we had lots of issues with grown-ups because, you know, all grown-ups did in the camp was to bring food. But these nurses had this very irritating habit of kept telling us what to do and what not to do all the time. And we thought, no, you know, this, that's not what grown-ups do. And leave us alone, you know, we want to get on with it. And we stuck to each other like glue give you an example. One day I was told off, made to stand in the corner as a punishment. The others were so upset with the nurses, they all came and stood in the corner with me. <laughs> so this lasted for a year. Just as we got sort of settled down and we were getting used to being in England, uh, this house was taken back and we had joined the older children not far away in Lingfield. And, um, but also this was only temporary. And in fact, uh, we're often, as a group, we're often referred to as the Lingfield children because uh, once this house was also taken back, uh, a permanent home was found for us in Isleworth in West London and we called the house Lingfield House after being in Lingfield. So I thought, well, this is it now, you know, we can just get on and, you know, no more <coughs> moving around. But then the Jewish community decided six of us were still young enough to be adopted. Uh, not surprising, these days then only babies were adopted and we were tried out at weekends always to be returned rejected on Monday, which, you know, was fine, no issues with that. And then 
But one day an older Jewish couple decided to keep me. They didn't have any children themselves and they took me back to London where they lived. On the way there, they decided to change my name from Bella to Joanna. Well, I was very miffed about that. <laughs> and, uh, I thought, well, what's wrong with the name Bella? Because that's who I was. And I thought, well, if there's a game, maybe I can choose. No, they already decided. I thought, it's a stupid <coughs> name anyway. I mean, you know, who wants to be called Joanna? Anyway, I had no choice. Um, so from moving to having lots of children around all the time, I became an only child. All their life, they pretended I was their natural daughter. When I was eight by now, I was very small. You can see I haven't grown much. Um, I had red curly hair. I just say I was eight years old. And they were extremely tall, both nearly six foot. Very dark, you know, dark haired. And, I mean, you know, everyone must have known I was adopted. But all their life they pretended they, everyone played the, played the game. There was no one I could talk to or talk about the past. I wasn't allowed to keep up with the other children. Um, <clears throat> they wanted me to be their daughter, to like the things that they liked, to do the things that they did, to be like they were. And of course, you can tell by now, I was a pretty obstinate sort of girl. And uh, very clear about my own identity. And I was determined I was going to keep my identity of Bella. On the other hand, I had to go along and be this Joanna. I mean, you know, you can't fight all the time. So I had this sort of double identity, which actually was quite difficult. And going to school was difficult. I'd missed some schooling. I still had health issues. Um, people must have thought I was a bit stupid at times. I had a lot of catching up to do. I had to learn to speak with an English accent, which I think I managed. Uh, but, you know, I had to... I had to pretend I was English, that I, I wasn't born in Germany, I wasn't to talk about being Jewish because it was like an anti-Jewish feeling <coughs> at that time. And, uh, you know, there were lots of things I wasn't allowed to talk about. So it was quite difficult. But I was fortunate that I was good at sports and everyone wanted me in their team and eventually I represented the school. So, you know, life was okay in the end. Uh, but, you know, it needed a lot of catching up. I eventually married a Jewish man, died now uh, 12 years ago, and I have a, a son and two daughters, um, eight grandchildren, and uh, I enjoyed every minute of bringing up my children, going through a second childhood, I'm not going through a third childhood with my grandchildren. Uh, I don't have to join the gym, you know, because all you need is twin boys of 12, and you, you <coughs> that's, keeping up with them is a full-time job, so, which is great, I love it. I love it. So, um, oh, right. Now, I know that you're probably burning to ask some questions, but I, I do just need to wrap up, if that's okay. Are we all right for time to wrap up with some thoughts? <coughs> um, what would have happened if uh, the Nazis had won the war? Do you think British people would have supported Jews? I'm not so sure. Certainly my adopted parents had considered suicide. They didn't believe that anyone would have helped them. And certainly when the Nazis landed in the Channel Islands, the very next day the chief of police had the list of Jews living in the Channel Islands on the Nazi commander's desk. And the concentration camp in Germany was emptied waiting for British Jews. We know that the governments throughout Europe, including the British government, knew exactly what was going on. They had photographs, they had aerial photographs. People had been smuggled into camps and out again with images and pictures. The more we, ha we have archive material opened up, the more we realise how much everybody knew what was going on. But it was always somebody else's problem. Oh, it's an internal German problem. We can't interfere. I'm not just pointing at the British government. Every, you know, it was widespread. Nobody wanted to interfere. <coughs> now, you know, we've talked about genocides both before and since the Holocaust. Now, everybody suffers. You can't compare one person suffering with another. And I, I feel it. What, what more could I have done? How, you know? And, but each genocide is unique with unique features about them. And what's unique about the Holocaust is that it was industrialised, cold-blooded. Everybody was involved. Now, don't say that lightly. We're talking about international business providing the Nazis with the tools. They knew, the, the, they knew what use they were going to be put. It wasn't Nazis that rounded up Jews in Europe. It was local people. And it wasn't because the Nazis told them to. They volunteered. The French people rounded up French Jews. 
every country they went into, local people rounded up Jews. Why? Because they could take their homes and their possessions. Less than half of 1% of people in Europe did anything to help Jewish people. Tiny, tiny minority of people. And yet it was possible to help. People did stand up to the Nazis, like these um, non-Jewish wives in Berlin, like the people in Albania, like the people in Bulgaria. The citizens of Naples stood up to the Jews, to, to the Nazis, because they were giving a list of Jews living there to the Nazis. Very few Jews got deported from those countries. Everybody was involved. Teachers were teaching that Jews were not even human beings anymore. It was good to kill a Jew. Teachers, doctors who swear an oath to save the life of human Jews in the <coughs> conducting medical experiments without anaesthetic on twins and on disabled people. They wrote up experiments about how long it would take people to drown, to die of cold, of hunger, and thirst. And there were many ethical questions after the war. Should they use the results of these experiments? The first heart bypass operation was done on a Jew in a concentration camp with no anaesthetic. There are people that say, well, they didn't know what was happening. But it was local people, neighbours, betrayed neighbours, so they could take their, their things. Jews were taken out of their, their homes day and night, they were resisting. Jews in Berlin were rounded up and they'd shout out, come and watch, we're going to have some fun, we're going to kill some Jews in the woods. And they wrote back to their families, boasting about how many Jews they killed. Some soldiers refused to kill Jews. No soldier got punished or demoted. Camps were near towns and cities you could smell. It was reported widely in all the newspapers, including in, in Britain. How could you not know? And then the people say, well, even if we did know, what could we have done? And yet it was possible. Some people did help, but most people chose to participate. Now, Edmund Burke had said it only needs good people to do nothing for people to succeed. Is it possible, actually, to do nothing? Think about it. If you see an incident in the street or in a community, isn't it an active, positive decision? Are you going to intervene? Are you going to pretend you haven't seen it? Is that doing nothing? And what about if you hear a racist or nasty remark about somebody? Isn't it an active, <coughs> positive decision? Are you going to challenge that person or are you going to pretend you haven't heard it? Is that doing nothing? I think each one of us can recognise. Yeah? Can recognise this. We all have these opportunities. How many of us chicken out? Think about it. The Nazis could not have done what they did without the active participation of the vast majority of people in Europe. They just could not have done it. And I want to finish with what Pastor Martin Niemöller said. Now, I know it's controversial because he was uh, a Nazi sympathiser, but nevertheless, I think what he says is sort of tries to underline our responsibility to each other. Why we should care? He said, first they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the communists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for me. There was no one left to speak for me. Thank you. So has anybody got the question they'd like to ask? Well, I'm very happy to answer whatever. Um, yes, at the back. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, how Jews were unlikely to protest about what was happening to them. I was just wondering if you had any ideas why it can, be, it can seem that the Jews are so passive to their faith. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't say that Jews didn't do anything. I said no, nobody did anything to help Jews. Yeah. Um, now, um, there is a, a chapter in this website about resistance, 
there was a lot of resistance, uh, both passive and active resistance. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is famous, obviously. Um, Jews that did escape from various camps uh, uh, formed bands in the woods and actually set up a guerrilla campaign against the Nazis. And in fact, they were very successful in, in um, distracting the Nazis. You know, they were quite instrumental in distracting the Nazis from their campaigns. Um, there were many, and also, of course, there was a passive resistance of not resisting being dehumanized by uh, continuing, in some cases, to practice some sort of religious and cultural education. Um, if, you, if you like, that was passive resistance. But there was a lot of active resistance as well. Um, um, so that I wouldn't say, you know, uh, not enough attention is given to that. It was certainly there was. But, you know, if you're an unarmed, you're not trained as a soldier, and you've got soldiers armed to, to their teeth at your door, what are you going to do, you know? Um, sometimes you wouldn't resist because you prefer, well, it might be death later, but you've got to, every day that you're alive, there's a, a chance of being saved. You might be find a way of saving yourself. Whereas if you face a death, you know, the firing squad, you know, that's, you know, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's better to go along with it for a time and see whether there are opportunities later. So, but, you know, there was resistance. And I said, there is, there is some literature about it, so I would advise you to go uh, to sources, but certainly there's some information on the website here. Uh, these are free, by the way. Help yourself to leaflet afterwards. Question here? Hi, John. Uh, yes. As you probably know, this week, uh, the only surviving member of Holocaust, oh, yes. a few days ago. Yes. I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, it's about 40, 50 years time, um, yes. what was the event exactly when? There, there will be no Holocaust survivors left in the world. Um, do you have any concerns, worries that, about things like this event? How will the Holocaust be remembered? Yeah. And are you worried that it might, as it goes further away from history, become less, less yeah. important and less relevant? Um, well, yes, it is obviously a concern to all the uh, people uh, promoting Holocaust education. I mean, that's partly why we've developed the website and also the books. Um, so um, some people are saying, you know, what about our own children? Would they take on the family story? I don't know, there's, there's issues around that as well. But, you know, I personally, I mean, this is a very personal view, so don't quote it as HET policy. Um, because I don't work for the HET, I'm, I'm, I, work, I don't work, I'm, I, I speak on my own behalf. But, um, so don't run away with the idea it's HET policy, but I feel, personally, that I would like to see survivors of other genocides going around to speak, because... You know, by talking about genocide, we're not unique. Really, you know, things happen all the time. Um, you know, it shouldn't be all on our shoulders. You know, we want to pass the baton on in a way to keep it relevant. And I think that um, there is a lot of literature about the Holocaust. We have to decide. The, the, the trouble is combing through all the literature to find out what's good and what's bad and what's right. Um, but obviously, if you read testimony of individuals, that's fine. I was a bit concerned that this lady said that her music saved her. It was rubbish, because most musicians were killed. Uh, it might have saved her sanity, uh, but you know, survivors want to look for reasons. Why did I survive, and why didn't they survive? And you look for things, but it's not just one thing that makes you survive. You know, it could be because you're cute. Maybe because you keep quiet when other people are crying. Maybe you, you stay in your little place and don't run out and make a nuisance of yourself. Maybe it's because you've got good genes and you're healthy, both physically and mentally healthy. Um, you know, people survive in different situations. And maybe some people had more support than others. Uh, maybe they had a different type of job. Um, it certainly helped to survive mentally with the music, but most of those musicians in Theresienstadt were killed. Uh, it didn't save them, uh, even the orchestra in, in Auschwitz and so on. A few survived, like a few others, but it didn't save them. And I think I was worried about that, because people taking it out of context might assume that that was true, but it wasn't, because most of those 
Um, I went to, in Leeds, there was a big conference about the music of Theresa Schaap about a couple of years ago. And, you know, I mean, it's well documented that most of the musicians were killed. So, you know. Yeah. Sam? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been to Terezin. Yes. Um, many other. Yes. The Jewish importance in Jewish historian in Europe. Yeah. Um, you know that the museum in Prague, the Jewish Museum yes. in Prague, is a collection of former communal Jewish yes. buildings. It is now. It is now. Um, and in one of the buildings upstairs, there is a collection of children's drawings oh, right, yes. from Theresa Schnell. Yeah. I actually, I was on research on one occasion in Prague and my mother came and yeah. I took her on a tour of the museum and she couldn't go into that room. Is there one of your drawings there? Right. Um, well, the drawings in Theresa Schnell is very interesting because I have a great issue with those. Uh -huh. um, no, I was too young. I mean, certainly with some of the older children, um, some artists who've been deported to Theresa Schnell were trying to uh, try and prove people's lot to get them something to think about to draw. I have an issue with them because it does not explain what these pictures are about. There's, in particular, first of all, there were no flowers, no, no nothing in Theresa Schnell, or trees, and, until after the Red Cross visit, where they <coughs> tried to do something. Um, there's a picture in particular of prams underneath a row of trees. It doesn't explain they're not babies in those prams, right? Everyone assumes, oh, how lovely, you know, they're all sitting under the tree, getting the fresh air, and, you know. The prams were used like shopping trolleys to transport goods around the camp. There were no babies in there. Babies were killed. The chance, you know, there were no babies that were very one or two, but you know, basically most babies were killed. So they, they were not babies. So it gives the wrong impression that they should tell about this and explain, and they don't. And I think it glamorizes in a way what was going on. And I have an issue with that. And I have an issue with a lot of Czech people that they're minimizing what happened in Theresa Schaff. I don't know whether they feel guilty or whether they want to say, well, we've checked people where you weren't as bad as the Poles or the Hungarians or whatever, you know. They were trying to minimise their own uh, complicit, complicity with the Nazis. So I, I'm a little bit worried about this. But, and, and I mean, like the Hungarians are doing now, all their, everything in the Nazi, in the, art, in, in the museum, uh, every, everything to do with the collaboration has been removed from the museum. So very, very concerned about that in Hungary. And I think that to a more or lesser extent that other countries are doing the same. Yeah. Did you ever think of changing your name back to I did think about it. When my doctor <coughs> died, oh, must be eight, 17 years ago, something like that. Uh, but then I thought, well, you know, everybody knows me as Joanna now. But, and it's such a performance, you know, driving license and passport, you know, all the rest of it. And then I thought, no, I wouldn't bother to do it now. But um, but my birth family know me as Bella because I've, I've met them since. And so I, I've used my birth name. And when I write articles and so on, I often use my birth name as well. So I use both names now, which I'm quite happy. You know, as an adult, it's, it's not so difficult to deal with having the double personality, the, the double... Um, Double life, I suppose. Um, so, so it's nice that I was able to use both names now. It's good because I, you yeah, know, that's who I am really. Yeah. Um, you know, being a child, um, perpetrators in that way, just to use the document again, or people in camps, did they always seem fully desensitised? Did they always, sorry? Did they always seem fully like desensitised to what was happening? You know, like the non-Jewish people. No, they weren't. They were involved, actively involved. Did they, were they always like persecuted or was there any? Well, until the final solution, the Nazis just wanted the Jews to go. No, nobody wanted, nobody helped them. No, did you have, no, no, you care for And so by the time the final solution came, then it was harder to help Jews, but people still did. Uh, but it wasn't impossible. Uh, um, I'd say no soldiers got punished 
for lots of energy. You know, I think there's this, I think it's very convenient for those that, for want of a better word, stupefy. I don't think there is, a, I don't think there is such a thing, but I think it's convenient to say, well, we were too scared, and we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, oh, well, everybody did it. Um, it was, they, they stole from their neighbours. You know, I mean, they didn't just stand by. They were actively involved. They knew what was going on. They, it was in the papers, it was everywhere. You know, they, a lot of people had Jewish friends, neighbours. You know, Jews were relegated to a ghetto. Jews were living in the society. You know, there were lawyers and doctors and dentists and business people, owned shops. You know, you couldn't not know what was happening. I mean, how can you stand by and say, well, one day, you know, this Jewish shop had got stones through the window and paint daubed all over them. How can you say they weren't, you know, they were actively involved. And, you know, it's very convenient to say I was too scared, isn't it? Um, the other children who were in the house with, yes. um, you said that you weren't allowed to talk about them or contact them and find yes. out what happened. Have you ever tried to do it now? Have you ever tried to contact the other five children? Uh, well, of course, first of all, I'd lost total touch with them and they'd all been adopted and, and you know, didn't know where, didn't know their names, didn't know, I didn't even know where to start. But it happened that an American academic, uh, in the University of Southern California, she was child therapist doing some research, and she'd read that Anna Freud study, and decided she wanted to do a further study to find out how they turned out as adults. And she'd actually found us all. And I, was, I think I must have been the last person she found, and, uh, and so she came to visit me and asked me some questions, and she, she told me that one of the boys had died of cancer as a young man, he'd been adopted in America, became a doctor, uh, one of the one other boy had been adopted in America, uh, went to, was sent to fight in Vietnam, you know, from one to the other. But he was, you know, he was in a psychological mess. But I did meet him once, and you know, and I met him, and of course we communicated on the internet. And then the third boy lives near me in London, and we're in touch. Of the girls, one girl is in a mental home will never come out. And um, the last one was adopted in, in London. But it, I did meet her once, but I, I she she wants to go on with her life, doesn't want to look back.